uh, City Council meeting on legislative matters. I am City Council uh, at large, Bill Dwight presiding. Um, this is a special meeting. It will be a special he hearing in a moment. I will ask for us uh, to put this open to the public hearing. Um, but the, the main focus on this agenda is to discuss the report and uh, executive summary of the Charter Review Committee that worked all last year on uh, with, through, I've forgotten how many meetings? Yeah? No, that's like 19. 19. 19. 19 yeah. meetings, 19 public meetings. Uh, some attended much better than others, uh, but discussing the uh, modificate, possible modifications of the our city charter, or essentially the equivalent of our equivalents of our constitution. Uh, a document that dictates and determines how we govern ourselves. So, with that little preamble, I'm going to ask uh, the Administrative Assistant, Laura, would you please call the roll? Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Shera. Here. Here. Councilor Maori. Here. Councilor Thor. Here. So, uh, is there a motion to open the public hearing? Move to open the public hearing. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 So we have, um, normally the process for the hearing is uh, you have the people who are pro speak, and then the people who are opposed speak, and then people who are just curious or indifferent or interested in expressing themselves speak. In this instance, um, we, we're going to start off with a presentation, but we're, I do have public sign up right now, and if people are interested in, in making public comments now, before we get into the meat of the, uh, the discussion, we can do that. And uh, well, let's, uh, do you, you want to speak first and, or? I, I can't even come here at this back here. So I don't know, I, I can't remember if, if before you had people speak or if you did it after. In, in a hearing, we, in this case, we actually will open up to the public to speak after the presentation. You can speak before, whatever you feel most comfortable. Anybody else signed up? There are a few other people, yes, signed up. Could you ask them also? I, I, I will ask, you want me to skip over you and ask them? You're yeah, just first I mean, on the list. I don't want to be the only one that wants to speak now. With, I don't want to, you know. Yeah, I want you to feel comfortable and I don't want you to worry about that. How, how about we go, uh, Zane, would you like to speak? Now? Yes, I would. Okay. <clears throat> And yeah, the protocol here is step up, identify yourself. You only have to identify what town you live in. You don't need your address. So. Well, my name is Zane Lomelsi, and I'm going to say my address. It's 20 Hampton Avenue, also known as Hampton Court Apartments, because it's relevant to what I'm going to say. Um, so uh, our city councilor, JT, uh, came to a meet and greet last week, I think. It was, it was very nice. And, um, a couple of issues came up, and one issue is, is I've wondered about for quite a while. Now, um, uh, tonight he told me he already answered my, one of my questions. So the issue is uh, when the city does things for homeowners, often renters aren't included. And so um, JT just did inform me that in the... Um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, the rebate or some of uh, The senior rebate? Yeah. yeah. That it does include renters. So that's good. Uh, the, the other example that I'm aware of is um, that when the planning commission has to notify abutters within 200 feet, they notify the owner of record. So in our case, a building was being built and proposed next to us. And we're a five story apartment building. Seven departments, and the owner is in Boston. So presumably, I wasn't able to trace it, but I presume the owner got the got the notification. Unfortunately, there was no building manager at that time for a couple months, so no one in the building was aware of the hearing. We, we a lot of us wanted to go to a hearing. Um, so my my suggestion is, with that or with anything else that involves um, residents and, and homeowners that renters should be considered. So, like, for example, in that particular law, uh, it's more work for the planning board, but it's not that onerous, I don't think, to send a letter to each abutter 
uh, each resident who's in the photo. Um, lastly, uh, another resident, he didn't make it tonight, but he asked me, he's, he's concerned, well, he's been advocating for food trucks. And I don't know if there's a, if that issue is in, in this document. Actually, actually, all the things that you mentioned so far wouldn't really actually meet the threshold of, of charter inclusion. Um, but all of them are valid considerations, and in fact, uh, okay. once it would be more on the council, that would be in our plate as okay. a city council. This is establishes separation of powers, establishes uh, process of voting, um, uh, such like. And actually, if you, you're able to stick around for the presentation, you have a sense of that. But I will a little bit. But um, so so there's no language. Charter? Well, there would be an ordinance thing, so you're saying Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Delia and Noah, do you want to speak together or you're both signed up here together? Yeah, we'll speak together. Yeah. You're, you're up. What? All right. Um, I'm Noah Cassis. Uh, I'm 17 years old, live in Northampton. Um, and I go to Northampton High School, and I'm the chair of the Northampton Youth Commission. Um, I'm Dahlia Breslow, 15 years old, also on the um, Mayor's Youth Commission, also got an NHS. Um, and yeah, we're here briefly to uh, just uh, speak again about um, the provision in the Charter, which will lower, um, or take the next step towards trying to lower um, our municipal voting age towards 16. Um, we're here in strong support. Um, and we, we want to thank you, um, the entire city council, uh, the mayor, everybody that's been so supportive of this measure up till now. Um, and you know, we hope that uh, it will it will be moving forward um, with your full support. Um, we really believe that it is the best way to um, promote civic engagement among young people to turn up uh, to turn up the young voter turnout. Um, to turn up actually all the voter turnout because families with young people and 16 and 17 year olds who vote in them, statistically from s countries and c cities that have done this are much more likely to vote, right? So um, for a, a myriad of reasons, uh, we thank you and think it's the, the right decision. Do you want to say anything about it? Yeah, just like for your continued support if this process goes longer than we hope it will. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Well, Delia, that's all I have signed up. Do you want to speak? <coughs> I have a few topics I wanted to talk about. Um, I guess I'm going to start. I received a letter from uh, the person of the attorney is carrying in charge of Port 2. My house is on Elm Street, so I'm um, Port 2. I've lived there for 20 years, I've paid taxes for 20 years. Um, I went to all the meetings with the exception of one regarding what's going on. And uh, like always, I paid all my dues and taxes and all the things. But um, I was um, a little uncomfortable how there were so many questions going on. And for the first time in all the years that I come to meet city meetings, you know, different kinds of meetings, I just thought that for the first time, questions were not answered properly. And the last meeting that was uh, in Leeds Elementary, which I went to, there were two older men, older, much older than I am, that had gone also to a lot of the meetings. And they were asking questions, and maybe the mayor is really stressed out, or he was overtired, he hasn't slept. But it, it was just, um, frustrating how he just wouldn't answer the questions and whenever I come to your meetings you know I've been able to call up on the phone and get all the information that I need and I've come to my house happy because my questions were answered you know one of the things is I, I punch through at the website to see how much money and it was almost $355 more a year, plus $208 for the Preservation Act fund. So that put me over $500, um, an increase in taxes. And my question was, is that going to be every year? 
and he would not answer it. And he said that once the first, if it goes through, once the first payment I make, you know, the first advance, um, that um, that was going to be the base. So it's my understanding that if it goes up over $500 the first time, then the following year it's going to be $500 more on top of that. That every year is going to be $500 more. Not just $500, but that my base, let's suppose that I pay $10,000. So that makes it $10,550. So that means that the next tax is going to be put in that amount with the first five hundred, you know, it, so, uh, I, as much as I wasn't the only one, I was not the only person asking. And, and the thing is, like everything in life, you know, when money is up front, you want to know what you have. You want a straight answer, yes or no. And I'm, and Ms. Martinez, I'm going to frustrate you a little further. I'm afraid. And the reason being, the agenda is to discuss the charter. This is not about the um, override discussion, but but I may offer some relief for you. Um, I'm going to volunteer your counselor, Karen Foster, who is right over there. Okay. And okay. she can help you with work through this out. There, I do. I could answer for you, but it's not on the agenda, so it's actually it would not be proper or appropriate for me to address. I couldn't remember exactly. If no, that's I could include fine. other things. That's perfectly It's just fine. that I am big in planning and preparation. And I like to know upfront what's going on. That's I think that's I perfectly think. reasonable. And, right. and and unfortunately, all, we're going to be talking today about this one item. And if, if the override were on the agenda, we could discuss that with you. But That's okay. Another thing is that I saw in the letter that I received about um, the voting age down to 16 mm -hmm. and what I could think about is my, my daughter graduated from Smith and she went out the year abroad thing that they do nowadays not when I went to college just stayed there for other years but anyways um, you know in other countries if you're not an age of a certain age you don't vote and I just I'm thinking, you know, at 18 they draft people and they go to the army and all kinds of stuff. But I'm just concerned that at 16, you know, it's it's nice that they are interested in our process, but there's always a financial aspect to everything that we vote on. It, this is how I see it. And I, I think that we should be cautious of that because we adults are the ones that have worked really hard and we are financially responsible for the people that we have in our household. And uh, I'm just concerned that if, if something like that would be passed and many of them will vote, then they might think that it's okay but their parents are the one dishing out the money for whatever the process is. It, it's, it's just a thought, okay. you know, that I think is practical because we adults are the ones that dish out the money for everything. That's the way it is. And another thing is also, I could not understand uh, extending the right, right to vote to non-citizens on the aspect that, again, in other places, if you're not a citizen of the country, you just don't vote. Um, and I just didn't understand why, what is the rationale behind it? You know, what, what's going on? You know, I'm, I guess, you know, I've been an American all my life. My father fought in World War II. I went in there with the American walking troops seeing Hitler throwing babies off the buildings. And, you know, my whole family is American, and I, ju I just don't understand the process behind it, you know. What is, why are you guys, or who did that and why? I just want an explanation, that's all. 
Thank you, and um, perhaps uh, you might find the uh, presentation that's upcoming to be uh, helpful in that respect. And, and uh, one of the important terms to consider is uh, not necessarily citizens, but residents of a town, um, people who reside in the town, and granting them the right to vote, participate in their governance in a municipal election. So it's not national elections or even statewide elections. This is the opportunity to vote within their community to determine the governance of their community. But that would include something like an override, right? It, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes, it would. And, and we cannot assure that any, everyone that is a non-citizen owns property or pay taxes, do we? Well, here's the problem. Well, it's not a problem. But a long time ago, uh -huh. we didn't require that you be a property owner to, in order to vote in the United States. Back uh, quite a while ago, and I couldn't, uh, over 100 years ago, I'm not that you, were, you, need, right you need to be a property owner in order to vote. You couldn't vote if you didn't own property. And by the way, property also included other people. You were able to own slaves and vote. And you could be male. That was it. Male property owners were the only ones who were allowed to vote. That's since changed, um, by my reckoning, for the better, uh, that allows for residents to determine whether, how they will be governed, because it's not necessarily contingent on whether they own property. It's a question of whether they can live equally with equal opportunity within their community. They could be renters, they could be visitors, they could be students, they could be homeless people, be entitled to participate in their own governance. That's the rationalization. I mean, so. No, I understand that. I was just um, thinking about money. No, I understand some, that too. Some voting things require money being paid. And sometimes, unfortunately, right, you're some non-citizens uh, have not had the opportunity to even validate whatever profession they have because you need licenses for everything nowadays. You know, that kind of thing. That's true. And, and, so uh, they, and because of that, they cannot earn a good professional salary. Many of them, unfortunately, are having um, basic low wages. Right. And then again, you know, if things if we're voting on something that requires money, then that means that if they rent, then the rent is going to go up because the owner of buildings and, and houses are going to, you know, if you have to pay so much more, then they're going to raise the rent. And it was just a talk. No, I thank you for that. Oh, uh, I do thank you for that. Something to think about. Yes, thank you. Okay. Do you have any other? Testimony or questions? Um, I guess one last thing is that um, I, uh, some people besides myself ask, you know, if we could see how, I know that in the Preservation Act fund that we pay, um, people make proposals of something that they want to do. And I thought my understanding was that it has to be something related with land or recreation use, recreation preservation, like and, um, and affordable housing. So um, I wanted to see how is it that we can get access and see how, you know, what the money was spent on, and if they have meetings or proposals, and if we taxpayers are allowed to go and find out how is my money being spent. The answer to all those questions are yes. Uh, they're all public do we get that information? Uh, at City Hall, if you go to the city's website, the CPA, may, meaning the CPC, the, the planning, the, the thank you, okay. Community Preservation Commission meets on a regular basis. It's posted, their agenda is posted, and the projects that are listed there. Um, also, and how much money is allocated. Then when they approve funds, it comes before the city council, another opportunity for the public to weigh in on how those monies are distributed. Um, also, if you wanted to submit a proposal, the same process is available on the city's website. 
So we taxpayers have to go to those meetings? Absolutely, yes. They're public meetings, yes. Okay. Yes. No, none of that's done in secret. It's the law. Well, they, they have to be public. I, I called the governor's office in Boston because I wasn't getting any answers. You're the only one that's giving me answers. And, uh, I'm better looking than the governor, I think. <laughs> 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 so anyways, um, I need to say that we never have a piece of paper regarding the taxes we pay. Yeah. He's funnier. <laughs> well, Lower center of gravity. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. <laughs> um, that's all we have signed up. Is there anyone else interested in speaking at this point, or would you... No? Uh, so next up, we... Uh, we have the chair and vice chair of the uh, Charter Review Committee, Sam Moulton and Sam Hopper, if you guys want to come and, and make your case, as it were. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks to the City Council for taking up the Charter Review <coughs> recommendations so quickly in the new year. We, we appreciate that, and we appreciate the opportunity to address you. Tonight. I'm going to talk about the process that we use to come up with our report and some of the guiding principles. Sam will um, summarize the major recommendations. I also want to acknowledge that uh, another member of the committee, Bob Bullrice from Ward 5, is here as well tonight. Um, the report consists of, of two documents, an executive summary of the major recommendations and an annotated version of the charter that includes all of the recommendations, minor and major. Uh, a number of those are what I would consider to be housekeeping items that simply add clarity to the language. Both of those documents were uh, approved uh, unanimously, 9-0, by the committee. And in fact, uh, with the exception of a few abstentions, uh, all of the recommendations uh, that, that the committee makes uh, were approved unanimously. Our work was guided by consideration of outstanding issues carried over from our most recent uh, predecessor committee, issues and suggestions made by the mayor, other city officials, and department heads, written and verbal testimony from members of the community, and our own review of the existing charter. As mentioned, we held 19 meetings between February and December. All of them had opportunity for public comment, um, and many people took advantage of that. Extensive minutes of all those meetings are, are also available. We held three public hearings that focused on specific topics, the first on election issues, the second on the question of appointing rather than electing a city clerk, and the third to review our recommendations. During that last hearing in October, the committee heard substantial testimony about extending voting rights in municipal elections to non-citizens. While most of the people who spoke at all of our hearings are res residents of Northampton, we also reached out to gain perspectives from outside experts such as Voter Choice Massachusetts on the issue of ranked choice voting and the Massachusetts City Clerks Association on best practices in, in selecting a city clerk. At all of the hearings, the committee heard near unanimous testimony about the major topics we considered. Even on those issues that had previously been contentious in Northampton or controversial elsewhere. Committee members remarked about how valuable those hearings were because they learned a lot that helped shape our major recommendations. We believe that the strength of our report results from the breadth of the topics considered, the weight of our major recommendations, particularly those addressing the expanded electorate, and the unity of our members. Again, uh, uh, our votes were all uh, unanimous with the exception of a few abstentions. Of course, not all of the dozens of suggestions or concerns brought forward deserve inclusion in the city's charter. There are several issues, however, primarily related to the city's commitment to equity and transparency in government, which we believe deserve further study by municipal officials to determine if they can best be addressed by future amendments to the charter or perhaps some other remedy. Those appear at the end of the summary, topics for further study under the categories of underrepresented communities, access to information, and access to elections. And of course, you know 
Um, but for the benefit of those in the audience, this is not a document that is inseparable. You can adopt whichever recommendations um, you wish to, to move forward, and, and, and you can actually add to, to our recommendations, um, and, and which, which Sam will now summarize. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback off of that so everyone knows. Um, we can amend the city charter at any point. Um, we are just required by charter to review it as a committee every 10 years. So I'm going to go through our major recommendations, um, kind of grouping it by theme, starting with expanding the electorate. So all these recommendations were done with the intention of expanding our electorate. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit on some of them just to address some of what we've discussed um, to address what you said. Um, so our first recommendation is to lower the municipal voting age to 16. Um, one of the forums that we held uh, addressed this topic specifically, we knew it was a, a bigger issue. Um, one of the arguments is actually 16 year olds are voting, I'm sorry, not voting, uh, working and paying taxes. And a lot of the things that we vote on, especially at a municipal level, directly affect um, young people, um, especially when it comes in terms of public schools. Um, so that was one of the things that was discussed at length. Um, we also voted to recommend adopting ranked choice voting in municipal elections uh, in an attempt to be more representative. Um, we voted to recommend mail ballots for all municipal elections to all registered voters, again, trying to expand the electorate, get more people to turn out and vote. Um, and then also recommended to remove the need to cite a specific reason for absentee voting. Um, right now, I think it's three things you have to um, fulfill to be able to be an absentee voter, and this would just allow anyone to vote absentee um, with no excuse. And then finally, um, as Dan mentioned, we, have, we held a forum towards the end of our time as a committee, um, and after that decided to recommend extending voting rights in municipal elections to non-citizens. Um, and just to address some of what was heard tonight, uh, we have a lot of non-citizens who participate in our community, in our local economy. They work here, they pay taxes. They send their, their kids to our public schools. So municipal voting directly affects them, but right now they don't have a voice. So again, this is another way to expand that electorate and make sure that the residents of our city are heard. Um, our next, the next chunk of recommendations, um, I put this under removing obstacles to run for elected office. While I just want to recognize this certainly doesn't solve everything, this was just one idea based off of state legislation. Um, to remove, uh, to remove putting a person, or excuse me, uh, uh, to remove from the ballot candidate running for re-election um, in, in an attempt to sort of level the playing field. Um, and that would be applied anywhere it was in the charter. Um, the next one, uh, as Dan said, we also held a forum on this, was recommending that we have an appointed versus an elected city clerk. Um, and we did not get any objection to that. Um, and we did help hold an extra form for that. We also uh, clarified pretty extensively some language in the charter under the temporary absences and vacancies in the office of mayor. Um, just to, there was a little, some gaps. So we uh, clarified the language and updated a little bit, especially with temporary absences. I think before it could have been interpreted if the mayor went to Boston for the day, would you have to have an acting mayor? So, you know, with technological advances like cell phones, you know, the mayor can access email um, pretty, pretty readily. So we uh, just updated that language. Um, also, in another way to expand constituent representation, we changed some language under vacancy in the office of mayor. So if in the chance, uh, a mayor was up for re-election and lost and possibly stepped down right away, that the person who was elected in November would be able to take office right away. And we actually saw an example of that pretty recently in Westfield, um, where the mayor did step down, but they had an acting mayor. So this, the intention of doing this is to really let the voters have their voice heard. They want this person as the mayor. Might as well have them start. Um, uh, this next chunk of things, while it might seem a little bit small, they were smaller tweaks, but the intention of these recommendations is to extend school committee provisions to Smith Agricultural School. Um, a lot of folks may not know that Northampton is the only 
municipality in Massachusetts out of 351 that has more than one public school district. Um, so we have the Northampton Public Schools and we have Smith Oak. So we made some changes here um, to add Smith Oak trustees, the, their essential school committee, to be um, invited to the discussion um, at the beginning of the year that's set up by the charter where there's a joint school committee and city council sort of budget meeting. Um, the Smith Oak trustees do go, but this would actually make sure that they are specifically invited and included very purposely in the conversation since they are part of the budget as well. Um, and then we also just changed up uh, vacancies, um, how they felt, so it, it was just in line with how we do it already with the school committee. Um, we changed some language for uh, the trustees of the Forbes Library, so for filling vacancies, they would have a little bit more autonomy, um, and if there was a vacancy on the trustees, the, the rest of the trustees would have the authority to choose. Um, uh, the next thing we wanted to recommend, um, the charter has an independent audit that the city council has to do annually, um, and we recommended just changing it, right, it was just a one-year contract, changing it to a three-year contract, uh, just to have a, a better relationship with the auditor, um, so they don't have to start from scratch every year if it changes every year. Um, and then I'm just gonna briefly go over some of the things that Sand had mentioned that uh, we didn't see it, we didn't see like specific charter recommendations here. Uh, we did spend uh, a lot of time talking about some of these things that we didn't think warranted being in the charter, but we're recommending that maybe the city council or subcommittee or someone take it up. Um, so the first one, uh, we did send a letter as a committee um, requesting that annual budget reports include more robust departmental activity. Um, we heard from some folks that they would just like to see more information and in an easier, more accessible way. Um, that letter was sent to the mayor. To the mayor, excuse me, yes. We felt that was the more appropriate uh, recipient rather than the city council. Correct, thank you. Um, and we also spent a lot of time discussing outreach um, and just participation in general to underrepresented communities. Uh, I think most of the underrepresented communities we were thinking of was race, but obviously that's not the only underrepresented communities we have. Um, and like we spent a lot of time on this. So, um, you know, I, I, I know that the city does some work on this, but uh, based on the conversations we had, um, I do think it warrants a, a bigger, more citywide look at this. Um, and then finally, just a study on the ability to have election related materials printed in languages other than English to be able to, again, reach more people. And that is the end of what I have. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. Um, any questions from the committee or any questions from the, the audience? Anybody have any questions of uh, the Charter Review Committee? Councilor Farrah. Um, so of the section on um, talking about mailing mail uh, mailing ballots, so this is a very apt time to have this conversation. We're seeing at this moment that, um, a, you know, in, in Super Tuesday states, right, where people had early voting, mm -hmm. that some of the people they had voted for are, will not be, um, you know, have dropped out. And while they'll still be on the ballot, they are no longer in the race. Um, did you discuss at all how this will impact those sort of situations where things can be fluid up until Election Day? I don't think we actually did dive into that. We did not. Um, I think that's a, a good point to consider. Um, uh, and it's probably more a applicable to uh, what we're facing on Super Tuesday, the presidential primary. Um, it's probably less likely, I think, that municipal candidates who are on the ballot will will, will drop off, although it's, it's possible. Um, I think that's... Uh, you know, it's 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 something to consider, uh, but you know, whenever you're voting, if you happen to vote, you know, if you happen to vote Friday, yes, you might have voted 
without the knowledge of the candidate you're voting for, he's no longer running for, for president. Um, uh, but I, I think that that that's, that's probably not. Uh, I mean, you have to sort of you, you sort of the way the pros and the cons, and I think our our intent here was to try to get that you know to sort of eliminate why people don't vote. If they have a ballot that's sent to them at their house, I think that's an incentive to to vote. And the city clerk Pam Powers came with numbers of how many people, or, you know, percentages of people actually voting in elections. Um, I don't have that with me, but I can get it to you. I, I still have a copy on my computer. So I, I think it's a really good point. And I think actually last last year we did see someone who was on the ballot who had dropped out of the race in our municipal election. So it can happen. Um, I think that's a discussion worth having. Um, but again, we, we recommended it based off of just low voter turnouts and how can we reach more people or get more people voting. Okay, um, following up on that, Bob, I was going to direct this to you. Uh, do you is, do you consider the ranked choice voting a, a prospect of eliminating this as a problem? So, for instance, if a candidate, municipal candidates are on a ballot, one drops out when someone votes, presumably they've chosen more than one, it would default to the next person. Is there a is there a mechanism for something like that? Certainly, the ability to rank your preference um, would provide an opportunity if candidates were to drop out. Um, I think it's it's kind of odd. There were two candidates that dropped out, you know, in the presidential election. Two dropped out today, the day before the election. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you could ever work around something like that. Um, you know, in in, in elections, in municipal elections, when 20% of registered voters turn out is considered a groundswell. I mean, all of our recommendations, a lot of our recommendations were geared toward encouraging participation. And, the, and that, to us, was the priority. Uh, I think, you know, you might be able to guard against last-minute changes by requiring that that mailed ballots or absentee voters happen, you know, you know days before the election, and, and that, that, that could give you some, some guarantee. But if you, to my mind, if you weigh the pros and cons of doing this, the pro of encouraging participation greatly outweighs the disadvantage that some of these unusual situations may, may present. Yes. I thought that um, maybe in the ballot you could have first choice, number one, and a name, and second choice. That's what that way, know. if one of them, you know, they circle, or, or they can write in, you can have instructions, uh, write down your face, put one for a first choice, and two for your second choice. That way, if somebody drops out, they, they have a a choice of the person voting, it's right there. Right. It's That's just essentially rank choice voting. Something to think about. That's the structure yeah. of rank choice voting, which is part of the recommendation okay. that the committee is making. So thank you, and I'm glad you picked up on that. Uh, Council Mayor. Yeah, I just was going to confirm there's no significant funding um, obstacles with mailing ballots. I assume they would just have, it's the same funds that would be used to kind of physically have in the component. I can, so Pam Powers gave us some numbers yeah it wasn't alarmed it, she wasn't alarmed by it but i can that's definitely fine. get that that's, um, that's, yeah because that that was like that came up was the funding for it this act this provision actually uh was proposed by the city clerk and um we did question about additional cost and as sam says she's not not concerned about it uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just to, to uh, get back on the, the mailing of, of ballots, um, it, it doesn't compel anyone to vote early. Uh, I mean, absentee ballots, yes, you have to get them back by a certain deadline. So if you are going to be out of the city and you want to vote absentee, then you would have to uh, complete it by, uh, by a deadline before election day. But if you're mailed a ballot, um, there's nothing that you know that compels you to to to, to vote early. 
that and that was just the point I want I want to clarify. This is this is in addition to polling locations being yes. open, of course, right? Yes. Um, this wouldn't be the only way that you could vote. And I, you know, I just say because I've I've been hearing consternation this week from people who say, oh, you know, I, either I was looking forward to voting for someone uh, that's no longer on, or I voted for someone who's no longer a valid candidate. Um, so it's just something, and I know that states are grappling with like do-overs and mm -hmm. how to deal with that for presidential primaries. So I just yeah. something to think about. And. As I understand, the, these are for municipal elections, these ballots. I mean, yeah. obviously, yes. you wouldn't be able to mail out national election ballots because it wouldn't be made available by the federal government. So. Um, other questions? Um, Councilor Jarrett. Uh, you mentioned in, you talked about the city clerk being uh, an appointed rather than an elected position. Uh, was there discussion during that of who should appoint the, uh, the city clerk? There's a number of municipalities in Massachusetts where the city council appoints the city clerk, others have the mayor. We, we did talk about that in length. Um, and did we make our specific recommendation would be under the mayor? Um, one of the reasons with the city council, but we didn't recommend it for the city council is a mayor would be one boss versus, on our council, nine bosses. Um, I know there's more to this. Would it be the same process of other appointments? Of other, yes. Um, so it would be a recommendation and then it would be approved by the council? Approved by the council. Um, yes, but I don't think, but correct me if I'm, if I'm misremembering on this, I don't believe that we uh, we, that we made a recommendation about the appointment process. I believe we did. I, I'm sorry? I believe we did. We did? Yeah. Okay. And it, the mayor would the mayor, appoint yeah. with the city council approval. Okay. It was East Hampton does, uh, the city council makes the appointment. Um, and it was discussed and considered as a, uh, whether that be appropriate here as well. What the concern that Sam brought up was one that, I mean, principal reason that's offered to have a city council do it is that the clerk does not feel the pressure of serving an elected official who has agency over them. Um, but then of course it'd be, the concern was that becomes amplified when you split it up between nine counselors. One counselor decides, a badly behaving counselor decides, there's an opportunity there to um, enforce their will on uh, on on the city clerk and that's diffi more difficult to manage than if a mayor were um, the the council serves as the check against that and protecting the city clerk in that respect from the if a mayor were to go rogue and decided that they were going to uh, uh, essentially co-opt the city clerk's position that the council the, the whole structure of this charter is designed the council would serve as a check and balance against that. There is no consequential check and balance against a council that decide any one council that happens to go rogue, other than we don't even have a system of censure here. So there's not much, there's, it's more difficult to manage, is essentially the concern. One of the other differences, oh. yeah, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. One of the other differences, too was, um, and I don't, I don't remember if this is for all the municipalities that have the city council appointed, but I remember for the clerk from Beverly who came out and spoke with us, he clerked for the city council, which is not the case here. Um, right. So that, that was a, another thing we took into account. And, and he was also a former city councilor. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that the, uh, it's clear, it's right here in the, in the, in the recommendation that, that the reason for having the mayor appoint and the, the council confirm is that that is the um, that's the process that's used for major department heads in the city so it's consistent with what exists uh, Ms. Martin. Um, my question is is there a term limit on that appointment it's like right now you know certain positions have a term limit four years eight years whatever for appointments, no. Appointments are essentially a hire. 
there is no term limit. You serve at the pleasure of the, of the community, who, of, in this case, it would be at the pleasure of the mayor. So if the administration changes, then the person might change? That is possible, yes. Ah. Uh, Councilor Chair. So just to clarify, the, the only power the city council has, uh, like if, it, if a city clerk began behaving badly in the sense that doing something to benefit the mayor, for example, in their next election, the city council would not have any power to um, intervene in that in any way. The only power is the for first approval. Is that correct? Well, of course, it depends. It's a, as a hypothetical, if the clerk's violating the law, th then they can be held to account. Right. Uh, if they're not, if it's not a violation of the law, but it does seem clever and it's gaming it, uh, um, as in the case of all these things, there's not, the, you know, that's a political question. It's not something you can embed it as a structure in the charter. But, um, you know, there are other towns in Massachusetts that demonstrate this uh, to great effect. Uh, I'll say most of them are on the east, but uh, not not in the case of appointed positions by and large, but way undue influence in some cases or play influence. But as long as it's within the letter and the law, there is not much recourse the council has. Yes, and conversely, the same would be true as long as the councilors who are presiding over a clerk were within the letter of the law, there wouldn't be anything. Else. They can be done either. Other questions? Yeah, uh, I do. Oh, uh, Councilor Thorpe and then thank Councilor Shara. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you to the committee for doing this. Are there other uh, states or local governments that have extended municipal elections to non citizens that you know about? Okay. Yes. There are. Uh, I don't believe there are any states. Um, there are some uh, municipalities, San Francisco uh, did, um, and, and there have been scattered other uh, others that have, have, have done. There's also, I believe, under consideration of the legislature, um, a, a statewide, but it is being considered a statewide granting of residential voting rights to, to non-citizens. I don't know where it sits, but yeah. And has there been discussion about special ballots about for this, if this was to uh, pass? Uh, uh, it's special ballots in what sense? Uh, non-citizens, or would they all be on one ballot, or would there be a separate ballot for the non-citizens, if they were to vote? We, um, we didn't discuss the, the mechanism. Okay. Uh, nor did anyone nor did that come up in, in, in that uh, uh, particular form. Okay. Something that did come up uh, on that topic was the protection of non-citizens and who would have access to that information. Um, something we heard very loud and clear was that is a personal decision to make uh, as a non-citizen. If you choose to vote, you're an adult and you can, well, possibly a 16-year-old. Um, but that's not our decision to make for someone else. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. for mentioning that. Thank you. Councilor Sheriff. Um, so you talk about removing candidate for re-election um, for any uh, incumbent. But then under the section for school committee and trustees of Ford's library, you reference it for both of them that um, in certain instances, it w they wouldn't be allowed to have that designation. So they sort of cancel each other out. Is the understanding that if both of these were to pass the legislature, that it would then go in and make that change at another point? Yes. So or how would were, that language get changed? So if, if it were enacted that you decided to go forward with this and the legislature said, yes, let's do it, and the voters said, yes, let's do it, it would go through and strike that language. Um, we were advised by the city solicitor to not go through and nitpick every little thing, so um, thank you for catching that. Uh, I think we actually, we had to go back and change it to make, we didn't vote on that, mm -hmm. so. Right, there are now some instances in the charter where if you are appointed to fill a vacancy on a board, um, you are not 
a candidate for re-election because you have not and actually I been elected by the by the voters right. you were appointed. So we did not take out that language in case the the overall uh, removal of candidate for re-election does not move forward or is rejected at some point. Other questions? Other questions from the audience? Um, I'd actually like to make public comment, but not representing the committee. Sure, as okay. a citizen. As citizen Sam. So, um, You're going to be citizen Sam. Yes. I'm going <laughs> to the audience. I'd like to change Citizen Sam. <laughs> So I, I just want to briefly address something that, as I've mentioned before, we talked a lot about on the committee. Um, and I'm certainly not preaching. This is my perspective of an important topic. We talked about uh, a lot about underrepresented com uh, communities. Um, and I am a mixed race woman. And it was a very painful discussion. So from what happened uh, at Charter Review and what I experienced, and of course this is my experience, not everyone's, I would strongly recommend that if, if any committee or the council takes this topic on, um, that folks be ready to be fully vulnerable, meaning ready to make a mistake, but own up to it, um, and, and ready to have honest discussions. Um, I will own up to saying I was not ready to be vulnerable and, and say some of these things out loud before, but I am now. So I say this for visibility, like I am a mixed race woman that served on a committee, uh, and when we talked about race, it was very painful. Um, so I just wanted to share my two cents there, so you heard that. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Oh. Would it, would a, do you think a, um, a properly trained facilitator? Is there some, some uh, scenario that would have, would have made it less painful for you? I mean, that's one option. Um, I, I would just, I think personal preparation, right? Like knowing your audience is, is important, first of all. Um, knowing the race of the people that you're talking to. Um, not being afraid to, to say something and, and admit that it was a mistake or whatever. Just having these honest conversations. Um, I think uh, we, we talk, it's an important topic, we talked about it a lot, um, and there was a little bit of a stall in it because it was worried that, oh, we're not going to fix the whole thing. I, I don't think that's expected. I think, I say this a lot, um, not to let perfection stand the way of progress. So I think it's an important topic worth having, but in terms of how the best way to do it, my suggestion is to just really lay it out on the table and make sure those involved are aware of what's happening, know each other, and are comfortable enough to have honest conversations. I'm, I'm super impressed you all took this on. I'm really proud. This is a, a part of the review process that I feel very uh, proud of. Thank you for doing oh, that. Um, anything else? I say that. Uh, it's worth noting again that um, the two people steering this committee actually account for the depth, breadth, and sensitivity of the work that was done. And I don't think we can fully appreciate that here. But um, in other hands, it might not have gone so well. The and actually, the issue that Sam uh, mentioned here, he, 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 that was, it was, a, uh, it was a discussion fraught with preconceived notions and misconceptions. And it becomes particularly difficult when the community itself identifies as progressive and woke, as it were. And, um, and consequently, it actually made it harder, it made the conversation more difficult in some respects. Um, but the fact is, is that it is prompted and we are charged. And, it, and as Sam points out, it's not the discussion for underrepresented communities is not limited to race or even culture for that matter. It's actually, it's also, there's a, a class division, which is probably even more glaring in the city that is yet to be addressed and, and considered. And that was discussed also candidly. So, I, I served on this committee, by the way, I should identify myself as that too, I realize I hadn't done that, but I served on this committee as the council representative 
it was an honor, and I was very impressed with the process, very impressed with the product, as it were, and more impressed with the citizens who participated. And that's from the people appointed, most particularly, but also the citizens who came and testified. And people who, for instance, like Zane and Ms. Martinez, who would come and speak and take the opportunity to speak and participate in how they will be governed further. And that was the thrust of essentially this whole discussion. How can we make our governance more accessible, more inclusive, and more appropriate to everyone equally and fairly? And it is still an ongoing struggle, a work in process, which is why we're charged to review this every 10 years. And as Sam said, we can pick it up anytime. But in this particular case, um, I'm I, for one, am perfectly more than comfortable and proud to actually send this forward to, to uh, the state and see what they say, see if they sign off and agree with uh, the recommendations that we've made here, because I think if all of these come back to us with, uh, at least in the affirmative or at least an opportunity to put it on the ballot, then I think we will be a leader in this state, if I'm going to take an opportunity to brag, if we implement these things. We will be a leader in the state and we will set the high water mark and hopefully others will follow. So I'm very grateful once again. Can't thank you guys enough. This is fun, sort of. Um, it, it is more edifying and more valuable. And thank you all for um, participating in this conversation. Our next step now is whether to, I'll accept the motion to close. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to uh, maybe reiterate or put a finer point on it, but I just want to really also just very strongly thank you for the section on expanding the electorate and uh, expanding voter rights in Northampton. Um, I take extreme issue with the idea that um, people need to be landowners to have voting rights in Northampton or anywhere, and that um, we can sort of rank people's uh, rights in Northampton, depending on whether they rent or whether they're a citizen or not. Um, so I really appreciate uh, the efforts that you made and um, believe strongly that everyone who's a resident of Northampton should have the same rights. Bob? You know, oh, the, the students left us. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe that's... Um, Didn't you yeah, of all the things that were said in all of the meetings, when we had the meeting on election, the presentation that the, I don't even know the name of the group, the, sun, it was it the, the Youth commission. commission. The Youth Commission. You know, it was astoundingly oppressive. And, and um, again, when you think of the, of the low participation in all that we're trying to do to encourage people to not only vote, but to participate in their government, right? Um, to me, there's just no reason to think that whatever students age 16 and above would vote, the, the, the likelihood that they're going to be at least as informed as I am, you know, is very great. And in fact, um, the students that, that testified in front, of, in front of our committee were just so well informed, so well spoken, so mature. And responsible that I don't see how we can deny them the opportunity to participate. I, really, that was a very strong impression that the committee got. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Thorpe. Thank you. I, I attended uh, most of the Charter Review Committee meetings, and I must say that I was very impressed with the work that was conducted uh, by the group, and I thank you for doing it. I also like to thank uh, uh, Sam Hopper for your honesty in addressing the underrepresented uh, communities and uh, feeling uncomfortable and needing to be ready. And uh, I've sat in on many uh, um, uh, lectures, discussions on race and underrepresented communities. And uh, I, I think it needs to be looked at further. And uh, we need to look at the impediments and look at the